Moment. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the fall seminar series of the Unify Consortium. My name is Ben Korpowski, and I'm the organizational director of the Unify Consortium. And today I'll be giving you an overview of what kind of work we're doing inside the consortium and an update. Also, just to let people know, uh, we have around 15 seminars this fall. And later on in the presentation, I'll highlight what's going to happen the rest of the seminar series for fall of 2020. But we'll go ahead and get started here today. So before we get rolling into what the Unify Consortium has actually been up to, I wanted to spend a little bit of time, you know, talking about um, what the purpose of the consortium is and also why we need to focus around grid forming inverter technology. So as you can see here, Unify stands for Universal Interoperability for Grid Forming Inverters Consortium. We're really trying to bring together leading researchers, industry stakeholders, utilities, and system operators to discuss how to integrate grid forming inverter technologies into the electric power system and look for ways to really advance this technology as we move forward. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on the upfront of this particular presentation and highlight the need for grid forming inverters. So if we take a look at the United States and the energy system, this is basically similar to what's happening around the entire world. But in the US, the energy supply is really shifting to a system that has much more inverter-based resources coming online. As an example, you can see this graph down here in the lower left. We operate currently around 20% renewable energy in the United States, with the rest being provided by nuclear, natural gas, and coal. But if we take a look over at the upper right-hand graph, you can see that 20%. There's a big chunk of that is hydropower, shown in blue, but there's also an increasing amount of wind and solar. And currently, this particular year, in 2021, um, inverter-based resor inverter resources made up around 12% of the annual energy production. But you can also note that both wind and solar are being uh, added into the system at a very much accelerated rate. And wind and solar's energy production has doubled over the last five years and is expected to continue to grow rapidly. So we're going to see inverter-based resources really making up a large portion of the electric power grid in the United States very quickly. So what's driving this? At the end of the day, there's two big forces that are driving this. And then probably the biggest force is actually cost. Uh, cost of utility scale wind and solar are has dropped uh, dramatically over the last 10 years, and currently they are the lowest form cost of electricity as long as you have reasonable wind and solar resources. The other thing that's driving uh, the deployment of wind and solar technologies are clean energy goals. And you can see the map of the United States here, uh, either state goals or utility service territory goals, all uh, pressing the use of clean renewable technologies. So this is what's happening right now. How do we think about what's going to be the future power grid um, as we think about it? So a little thought, bit of a thought experiment that I have, which is if we're trying to get to 100% clean electricity in the United States by 2035, and that's less than 15 years away, what can make up that? Um, portfolio, if you will. If you take our current nuclear fleet, it provides around 20% of the energy, hydro around 7% of the energy. Um, you make up some amount, 10% or so, with clean hydrogen fuels or carbon sequestration or some type. What does that leave you with? If you look at it, it means that we're going to have a power system that's got 50 to 70% wind and solar on an annual basis. So obviously this is a very back of the envelope or back of the napkin calculation here, 
But I do want to highlight a recent study that just came out in the last couple of weeks from NREL that looked at this challenge of getting to 100% clean energy by 2035. And it basically modeled lots of scenarios, uh, different ways of meeting these particular goals. But at the end of the day, if you want to provide the least cost energy mix by 2035, it said that wind and solar are gonna provide 60 to 80% of the generation. So that kind of reinforces the back of the envelope calculation that we just did saying, you know, we're gonna be somewhere between 50, 80% wind and solar in the power system. And that means a lot of new wind and solar, as you can see here, over two terawatts combined, are, need to be deployed um, within the next 15 years. Again, the big critical thing here is that wind and solar are inverter-based resources, and that's gonna change how we actually operate the grid of the future. So what do we know now? If we take a look at systems that are currently operating with high levels of inverter-based resources, you see a lot of little uh, lines on this particular graph, showing off some small island grids, larger island grids, even large-scale grids in the United States. And you'll also note that each of these particular systems are independent synchronous AC power grids. So, uh, two things to realize here that are important. First, this little square box, that's an instantaneous uh, level of wind and solar or inverter-based resource. So at any particular point in time during the year. And the gray circles, that's an annual energy amount. So we're trying to get the entire grid of the continental United States, which is around a thousand gigawatts of installed capacity operating up over 50%. So we need that to be over here somewhere. But the key thing is that, that if you take a look at, we know how to operate very small um, power grids with very high levels of inverter-based resources. As we get to larger and larger scale systems, those numbers start to come down. And there, there are several technical reasons that need to be addressed. But this is a challenge that's happening right now and we need to be paying attention to it. We take a look at an example of uh, what's happening in the US right now. You take a look at the map down here in the lower right-hand side. This is a graph of um, a balancing area or uh, independent system operator called Southwest Power Pool, which basically is the middle of the United States going stretching from Texas all the way up to North Dakota. You take a look at um, the load for that particular um, balancing area, you can see that shown here as this red line. And then the green line is forecasted wind. This is back in February of this year, but you can see a point in time here where their forecast was showing that they were gonna be able to meet 100% of that load with just wind technologies. Now, at the end of the day, they curtailed this a bit so that that wouldn't reach but you can see that South, Southwest Power Pool in March of this year was up around 90% uh, renewable penetration levels across this entire area. So that's some amazing things. Now, the, the next part here really shows you why we need to pay attention to this, because this is not just a once a year kind of uh, thing that's starting to happen. If we look at the queue of, um, generation that's planned into SVP service territory, you can see currently they have around 30 um, uh, gigawatts of wind, but they have another 30 gigawatts of wind in the queue and 40 gigawatts of solar. So if we do a little thought experiment and start adding that solar on, by the way, these little bumps down here are the actual solar amounts, but if you had 42 gigawatts, all of a sudden these things would look like this you'd have these types of production from your solar. The nice part about wind and solar, at least in SPP service territory, is that they have very good um, sort of anti-correlation with each other. When you have high solar during the day, you have low wind, and then you get higher wind at night. May not always be the case, but at least in this particular week. 
the, the thing to think about though, is if we add another 30 gigawatts of wind into this system, all of a sudden that's gonna just basically add in another 30 gigawatts here. And with the new wind and solar, you're gonna be up above your load a majority of the amount of time uh, during the year. So this is something that's um, pretty close to being a, a reality and happening more and more. Not only is this happening in the United States, but we're seeing this type of, of uh, issue happen in Australia. They're already at parts of their system with 100% IDR. So if you take a look at the Australian uh, system here, the South Australian component of that, which is highlighted in this little graph. So this is October of 2020. They basically were providing 100% of their uh, native load, so the native load is this red dotted line with solar, both uh, distributed PV or rooftop PV in the light color here and utility scale PV in the dark color. Now they did keep natural gas plants running online and this is mostly to maintain operational stability and reserves inside this area. But we are seeing this and we're gonna to continue to see this more and more, is that during uh, hours of the day and practically every day, you will be having a system that is dominated by inverter-based resources. So back to this graph, if we think about where we are today, you get kind of a, 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 an idea with this curved line here. But what we need to be able to do is raise this up so that we can operate instantaneous levels close to 100% of inverter-based resources. And by doing that, we will be able to get um, the annual energy levels up over 50%. But that's really gonna be necessary is to move this curve here. So that's really why we need grid forming technology. There's a variety of technical challenges with these inverter-based systems. Um, I won't go through all of these today, but this is a good place to uh, just highlight that there's a variety of issues technical-wise around stability, around protection, around providing black star capability, and then eventually around looking at the system uh, resonances and oscillations from large deployments of inverter-based resources. There's been a lot of work in this space. There's a lot of activities in this area, and this particular consortium is focused on how do we bring some of these solutions together and address this. Now, if we think about the wind and solar that's been deployed so far, most of that is actually what we call grid following inverter-based resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that here on the next slide. When we think about what grid following versus grid forming really entails. So the output of inverter-based resources is gonna be some type of AC waveform. Typically in the US, it's a 60 Hertz AC waveform at a specified voltage. Um, in Europe, it would be 50 Hertz. But basically, if we look at grid following technologies, they basically assume that some other device is creating this AC waveform. And the grid following devices basically lock into this AC waveform synchronized to it and act as a current source and just inject current or power into the grid. Now, grid forming technologies, on the other hand, can actually make this AC waveform. They can act as a voltage source, they can synchronize together with each other, and importantly, they can black start a grid from a blackout condition. So we would see grid forming technologies as being a leader where grid following technologies are sort of this follower that just kindly marches along. Now, one of the things that we've been very interested in is how many of these grid forming inverters do you actually need on the grid at any specific time versus how many can be grid following? And that's something that we're still working on but you are going to need something at the end of the day, especially if you've, you've turned off enough of your synchronous generators, you're going to need grid forming technologies to act as that leader. Uh, so any grid following systems that are online can follow those. 
At the end of the day, there's a wide variety of benefits for using grid forming inverter technologies. You can maintain the system voltage. It has very fast response characteristics to disturbances. You now have a black start capability and can restart from blackout conditions. It also enables higher levels of wind and solar to be integrated into the grid. And the reason for that is because at some level, if you're just using grid following inverters, you will not be able to maintain operational stability. But we've shown even on small grids that if you have grid forming technologies, those can act as these grid forming sources and the grid following inverters can match up to those. You can improve system reliability and resilience. And you, there's also added economic value from providing a, a, a range of essential grid reliability services back to the system operators and the grid as a whole. So there's a, really a lot of benefits for using grid forming technology. And at the end of the day, we've been, as we've been uh, working on these projects, we've basically shown that in a lot of cases, you only need uh, software updates to change from grid following to grid forming. Now, if you want to do black start and other capabilities, you probably are going to have to add some kind of energy storage capability onto your system. But at the end of the day, there's not a huge added cost uh, when you go to these grid forming technologies. And one of the things we'd really like to see is that inverters, as they're deployed, can easily be uh, switching between sort of a grid following mode, but have that grid forming capability built into it. Okay, so where does Unify fit into all of this? Really, the Unify Consortium, the idea is to uh, basically come up with a forum so that we can address these challenges for seamlessly integrating grid forming technology into power systems of the future. And our name Unify really is meant to signify the unification of inverter-based resources and synchronous machines at any scale so that you can turn all your synchronous machines off if you had that opportunity, or you can run them in any level together. We have three major research focuses, uh, the R&D, uh, demonstration and commercialization, and outreach and training. And we started off in January of this particular year as a DOE-funded five-year project. But the idea behind this consortium is really to create a sustainable consortium that lasts beyond that five-year period that's really driving innovation in the electric power industry. I'll talk a bit about sort of how we're organized. Um, at the top level, we have a leadership team. With, they have external scientific advisory boards and a DOE review board. But the bulk of the work that we're doing is in these three areas. And inside each of these, you can see, and I'll talk a little bit more in the rest of this presentation about the recent work that we've done in various spaces. So research and development, the commercialization and demonstration, and finally outreach and training. This is the current project team. Um, we have a wide variety of uh, people participating in this from national labs and research institutes to universities to the industrial players and utilities and system operators. And we are also reaching out to a wider range just beyond the, the project current project partners to make sure that we're getting buy-in across the entire industry. So let's talk a little bit about the specific things that Unify has been working on over the last uh, nine months and putting together. So one of the big goals that we have in this consortium is really developing what we're calling a unified specifications for grid forming technologies that really standardizes the performance at a system level. So where the grid operator will be able to um, ask for requirements from grid forming technologies and at the inverter level where there'll be a set of requirements that define these uh, capabilities for grid forming and also um, build these in such a way that it's a vendor agnostic fashion. You're basically building a set of specifications that any vendor can meet um, and that any system operator would be able to employ into their system to ensure stable operations. 
So we really see this as this collaboration between inverter manufacturers on one end, the system operators and utilities on the other to bridge this gap. Um, because we're really going into a new world where power electronic devices, inverter-based technologies are going to be embedded in practically everything that connects into the grid. And we want to cultivate this culture of bringing these parties together and working out how to make sure the systems remain stable and operational. So I'll give you a little um, taste of what's being worked on right now. This is a table of contents out of the current version of the unified specifications that the members are working on. We um, uh, are looking at how these devices are going to be uh, required to act under normal operating conditions, on, under abnormal operating conditions, and additional considerations that they may need to take into account. Our goal really around this is to get a uh, version of this document out in the next couple of months so that people can start using this and specifying equipment. That will drive a lot of information flow in this area and help us to update this so that eventually we could standardize these types of requirements. So let me dive a little bit deeper into each of these areas. The R&D area covers modeling and simulation, controls, hardware, integration and validation. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the recent work that we've been doing over the last several months in these spaces. So in the modeling and simulation area, we're trying to develop models for uh, grid forming technologies that has a wide range of applicability. So all the way from the phaser domain uh, where you're doing um, more like positive sequence type applications, which would be slightly slower time scale, all the way, all the, way to the very fast um, electromagnetic uh, switching models. And we've started to develop a grid forming model library that's a place where we're gonna highlight um, how these models are actually working together and make sure that you can use these across various platforms. So we're looking again across all of these different types of software um, that would have models embedded in them for grid forming technologies. Some of this is already um, in action where a few of these grid forming models have been developed and we're starting to publish some of this information. So um, and we've also worked with several of the organizations like WEC, the Western Electric Coordinating Council, on how to integrate these in their larger scale models of large grids. And so these are different positive sequence models that have been developed by the team. And some of these are um, publicly available and we'll be making more of these publicly available as we start to work our way through them and validate them. Now in the controls area, we're looking at how do we make sure we can standardize some of the controls that go between the um, primary level controls that are embedded in the inverters themselves and the secondary controls where a system operator may be sending some type of signal out to the grid forming technology um, IBRs. So we're really focused on how can you basically set up these control algorithms to make them compatible with each other and with numerous uh, vendors uh, deploying similar types of technologies on the grid. So we've started working on developing these universal frameworks for grid forming technologies um, that are independent of sort of specific implementations. That allows us to, to generalize what these controls should look like start to develop prototypical implementations and make sure that at the end of the day, uh, a various set of controls can be very well defined. This also ties back into the modeling and simulation in that you need to understand what type of controls you're embedding in these systems so that they have accurate models uh, to be used in larger scale simulation uh, programs. And inside the controls area, there's basically uh, these three re research activities that are happening, looking at universal real-time grid forming controls for heterogeneous technologies. That's again, allowing us to uh, identify what type of controls are across many different areas. Then the system level stability analysis, how this ties back into understanding the stability uh, architectures for the grid 
And then third, making sure that you can actually do cybersecure real-time control over digital communication networks in such a way that uh, system operators are uh, comfortable with sending out set points uh, and information to these grid forming inverter technologies. In the hardware area, we're looking at how we take a lot of these control algorithms and start to prototype um, hardware that would then be real world implementations of these types of controls. And we're looking at how we can make sure that we can ensure compatibility across the spectrum of various converter technologies and make sure that there's uh, specific ways to embed this in the digital controllers that are used. So this kind of highlights a variety of different type of converter topologies that you'd run into with grid forming uh, inverters all the way from the watt level, if you will, up to the megawatt level. A variety of different actual hardware implementations, but understanding how to port those control algorithms into these systems. And in the integration and validation area, we're very focused on trying to make sure that we can validate the performance of these technologies across a, a wide variety of environments, uh, make sure that there's a conduit of how we take these research and development areas and um, provide a pathway to the demonstration and commercialization areas and evaluate at the end of the day, these unified specifications for grid forming technologies. So if we think about the integration validation area, we talked a little bit about the pure simulation environment and understanding how to build better models for representations of grid forming technologies. But we're also focused on both controller hardware in the loop and power hardware in the loop to understand how you can implement these at, at scale. And then finally, pure hardware and implementation so that we're making sure that when you put these into the field, uh, and you're just dealing with the hardware aspects that these systems will all work together. Uh, included in this, we're starting to develop a variety of test plans. For example, we have a one megawatt experiment planned for year three. Um, we may get this a little sooner. We're starting to work on the experiment right now, lay, out, lay this all out so that we can create a hardware test bed that would allow multiple vendors to come in as long as they're following these unified specifications, be able to plug and play with other vendors. Um, we'll have a variety of physical sizes, a variety of different types of generation and loads, and we wanna understand the implications of giving high level specifications to inverter manufacturers and having them develop a product that will work cohesively uh, with all the variations on, on this. So as we move to the demonstration and commercialization area, I'll just highlight here what's inside here. We have a 20 megawatt demonstration. There's IP management and domestic products, and then finally standardization of how to address grid forming technology. So if we think about what we're planning, um, and this is planned to be done uh, by the fifth year of the project, but we're looking at ways that we can actually get into a little bit earlier in the cycle here and get grid forming technologies deployed sooner than that so that we can understand at a large scale how these grid forming technologies will work together. We're looking at both um, large scale merchant plants uh, where you may take a large scale solar system that exists and retrofit some of those for grid forming technologies or where you have highly distributed uh, systems. So hopefully you're able to go in and retrofit lots of these smaller scale systems to have grid forming. If you take a look at what's out there deployed today, most of these, almost everything is grid following technologies, meaning they need a grid to synchronize to. And in, in such ways, if they experienced a localized blackout, they couldn't restart the grid or operate. So we're looking at how we can um, actually take commercialized products and update them in such a way that we can look for the, how we can define the benefits of these grid forming technologies in larger scale demonstrations. So uh, we actually are, have about five or six projects that we're evaluating right now for this demonstration, but uh, in case someone's out there listening to this for the first time, if you know of a site that's over 20 megawatts that potentially uh, is going to have grid forming technology capabilities. Feel free to reach out to me 
uh, and we'd be interested in talking to you about potentially uh, doing demonstrations at that site. As we move into where we want to take this, we're looking at how we can develop IP management around IP that gets developed uh, inside this consortium and outside the consortium, actually. And a general principle that we're trying to use here is what we call a core stack IP. So we're trying to identify sort of a minimum set of IP that would help um, users be able to implement the specifications as written. Of course, you can implement the specifications without and knowing what the IP is, but what we're trying to do is identify people that are interested in licensing their IP uh, that can help meet those uh, specifications over time. Again, uh, this consortium is really focused on how you would get access to it. Doesn't mean it's necessarily for free, but uh, you'd be ava um, hopefully available to, for licenses to that IP. Won't go through that in too much detail here, but we see that as kind of then uh, helping expand the domestic products and manufacturing side of grid forming technologies. And we're um, the, a consortium that's really focused on trying to encourage domestic manufacturing of grid forming technologies and um, develop these specifications in such a way that people can um, manufacture more of this type of product. Obviously, here in the United States, uh, when you're talking about going from, oh, what we're about uh, 13, uh, no, 11% uh, wind and solar now, 12% wind and solar to 70% wind and solar, we're going to need a lot of manufacturing capabilities to be built fairly quickly to scale up to large scale deployments of wind and solar like we've been talking about. Okay, finally, the last one in this particular area revolves around standards, and we there's two standards out there for people that aren't that familiar, IEEE 1547, which talks about distribution connected uh, distributed resources, and IEEE 2800, which is transmission connected uh, inverter based resources. We're identifying gaps in there specifically around what needs to be updated for grid forming technologies, and we'll be working with those groups to help them update those particular standards. So we're really focused on how do we get these systems um, better aligned with standards organizations. Okay, outreach and training. Uh, we've done work in education, workforce development, communications, and events. And I'll highlight some of the work that we've been done in this space. To date now on the education and workforce development, it's been mostly focused at identifying materials that uh, could be updated with grid forming technologies. So we haven't put out any new educational material, but we'll be doing that over the next couple of years. But we've been focused on standing up communication um, efforts on how to get the word out about what's happening in this space around grid forming inverter technologies and how to leverage this. So first thing on the list, if you have not gone to the Unify website, um, I'll leave this up here long enough that you can take your phone and click that QR code over in the right hand, and it should take you right to the Unify website, which is uh, this one down here. But this website has information about the activities that are going on in Unify, the team that's working on this, as well as a couple of things, the publication, so we're posting up uh, information uh, that is readily available on grid forming technology. So hopefully this is kind of a one-stop shop for what you can find out about grid forming. And the other one is the noteworthy event that highlights a lot of material, either um, little videos that we have available or other information on uh, uh, presentations from conferences and the like on grid forming technologies. So again, uh, the website is up and running and that's, uh, most of you have probably found it because that's how you registered for this particular uh, seminar series. We also have a LinkedIn group set up that where we um, push out information on a more uh, up-to-date basis. If you want to be connected into that, just go into LinkedIn and sign up for the Unify Consortium group. And then finally, the YouTube channel has been set up, um, and that's where we are posting all of the seminar series uh, 
both uh, the prior ones from fall of 2021, spring of 2022, and the current uh, fall 22 will be all up and posted on that particular uh, YouTube channel. And the seminar series is definitely one of our main ways of getting information out to the group. So we do roughly 15 seminars every spring and fall, at least for the next five years. I'll thank um, University of California, Berkeley for hosting the first uh, set back in fall of last year, NREL for uh, last spring, and then University of Texas, Austin for hosting and moderating the fall seminar series that we're starting here today. But this gives you an idea of where we're heading um, and making this information available for people to get updates about what's happening. Another thing just to highlight is we did have finally an in-person meeting in July. It was great to have uh, over 80 people show up and discuss grid forming technologies. And then we also did, this was uh, held at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We also did tours of some of the testing capabilities that we have at NREL on large scale evaluations of inverter based resources. So I'll start to wrap up here. First off with uh, the fall 2022 schedule and lineup of speakers. Um, so you can see them here. I'll leave this up just for a little bit. You can get an idea and download this information. Uh, and then each of these will be recorded and then we'll post this information up on the YouTube channel and the website. But some great speakers really at the cutting edge of what's going on in grid forming technologies, all the way from looking at wind and solar applications to offshore wind parks with HVDC links, uh, to various testing algorithms, um, probably the most cutting edge place to find information on grid forming uh, technologies. And with that, I'll say thank you, and we can wrap up. Uh, special thanks to the Unify Consortium Area Leads for providing information for this uh, presentation. You can see them listed there below. But a lot of people inside the Unify Consortium working on everything that I presented uh, here today, and I want to thank everybody uh, for all the hard work that we've done over the last uh, getting on nine months here. But uh, doing a lot of great things in the grid forming area. So with that, I'll say thank you. And we can go ahead and stop the recording.